it's very nice to be back at Wacken one more time. Years and years ago, I got invited to be at the Wacken Festival, and of course I said yes. I'd never been to it, but I'd heard about it. And so I did the festival, like three days, two days, and people were amazing to me. And then a year later, two years later, I got invited back. And I'm not used to getting invited back to anything. And so I came back, and it was even more fantastic. But on the second time, there was something I noticed. And it's probably all over the festival grounds, but I know it's backstage. In all the dressing rooms backstage, there's a poster for next year's Vakken. And so in my tiny trailer right back there, it says Vakken 2017. And the certainty of that, knowing that next year this is going to happen, it's one of the happiest deja vu moments of my life. I knew that poster was going to be in there. And the fact that tickets for an 80,000 person festival sells out within days of the previous Vakken concluding with no bands being selected. That means all of you just put your money down and say, damn it, I'm showing up. What bands are on the bill? I'm showing up. But what if you don't like any of the bands? I'm showing up. That kind of fidelity, that kind of allegiance, we can only have with something like music. You can't have it with your government. I'm from America. I'm used to bullets flying over my head. It is not for me to come here and tell you about your government. I wouldn't dare. It's just, it's rude. I don't like being rude. But your government has some parts of it that you don't like so much. My government, please. Sometimes I don't know what country I'm coming back to. Sometimes it's my country, sometimes it's a freaking movie about a country full of dumb people who like guns. I don't know. And so it's not always easy to get behind what the president's saying was happening on the news, but what's always easy to get behind is what's happening on your record player, what's happening at a show where the music and the musicians and the records and the bands mean more to you than any politician. Sometimes they mean more to you than your friends. They mean more to you than your parents. The records last longer than many of your friendships. And you will listen to these records and dig these bands from the time you were 11 until the day you die. And hundreds, of, and, and it sounds like I'm just rambling. Trust me, this is going somewhere. Hang around, you're out of the rain, it's comfortable, bear with me. Many, many years ago in the 1840s when I was young, I lived with my mother and we lived in microscopic apartment buildings around the Washington DC area. We'd live a few places every few years, we'd move, we'd move, we'd move, but the one thing we always had was a lot of books and a lot of records. My mom, Iris, Iris would go to the record store up to three nights a week and she would take me along. And if I looked at a record for longer than five seconds, she would just take it and put it on the stack. I go, why are you buying that record? Because you looked at it. Well, what is it? We're going to find out. And every time I tried to sneak around and turn on the, the TV, which is this big, she goes, no, 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 put on a record. And so my mom almost destroyed music for me, even with her pitch perfect taste in music. Stravinsky, Bartok, Coltrane, Miles Davis, Woody Guthrie, Arlo Guthrie, Bob Dylan, The Beatles, etc. So she plays me the first Jimi Hendrix record. I went, wow, that's the best. She goes, he's dead. Okay. So then she puts on the Joplin, uh, I think the Cheap Thrills album. I went, wow, she's dead. Like, okay. She puts on the first Doors album. I hear the song Break On Through. I'm like, that's my guy. He's dead. I'm like. What are you doing to me? Can you play some people who aren't dead? So she goes to Beethoven, Chopin, Wagner, dead, 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 dead. Everyone's dead. And so I started liking the records more than the kids in school because the kids in school would call me names and they'd chase after me. And I was a spaz anyway, so I'm on Ritalin so I don't lose my head and crawl on the ceiling. And so I'm a weird little kid tripping on pharmaceutical speed 
who likes my records more than the kids at school. I understood the, my records more than I understood my parents. My father was a magnificent racist, a fantastic misogynist, and an award-winning homophobe. He was just fantastic and terrifying and wrong about everything. And he didn't listen to any music at all. And so I'd wait to go back home from visiting him to go back to my room to put on the records. And then high school hit me and I realized I hated everyone in my school. But thankfully, I had been infected by degenerates before that. My mom had really crazy friends. And one day I was a little boy about that big. She said, we're gonna visit a man named Leo. Who's Leo? Who knows, it could have been her pusher. I have no idea. So we go to this house somewhere and she goes, okay, I'm gonna be with the adults. Leo's kids are gonna take care of you. They're very nice, go play. They're older. And they say, Henry, come with us. And I'm some naive kid high on Ritalin. So I'm like, okay. And so as soon as the parents disappear, they give me a warm can of beer. They go, drink this. I'm a go along, get along kind of guy. So I drink the beer. One beer and a kid this big, I'm drunk. I said, so where are we going now? They said, we're gonna go to the store. I like to go to the store. So we go into the store and I watch these two start shoplifting every single thing in the store. And they're just shoving stuff in their army jackets and they're giving me stuff to steal too. So I'm like walking out with like cans of stuff. Then we went into an auditorium where there's some basketball game. They stole the American flag from the auditorium and stuffed it into the jacket. And we come staggering back, drunk, thieves, back to the basement of this person's house with cans and a flag and all kinds of crap you can't use, but it was ours because they stole it. That was when they put on a Led Zeppelin record. And I heard, I heard the immigrant song. A cinder block basement, the smell of bad weed, warm beer, stolen goods on the ground. That's when I heard Led Zeppelin. And I was hanging out with frickin' thieves. And that's when I realized I'm a degenerate. These are my people. And this is my rock and roll. And so and it imprinted on me very quickly. And so being a very bad boy who got thrown out of schools for being violent and psychotic, they put me into a school where you put on a uniform, the teachers are basically allowed to beat the daylights out of you if you even look around. And so by 14 years of age, I'm this, this big around because of Ritalin, and I'm in a uniform and I hate everyone in the place. And with all the courage I had, I walked up to this jock, big guy. He's sitting on the floor with one of those tiny tape recorders with a single speaker with this amazing wild music coming out of it. And I was trembling from fear. And I walked up and said, oh, excuse me, sir. Who's that that you're listening to? And he looked up at me like I was an idiot. And he went, Ted Nugent. And so I went to the record store that afternoon in my prep school outfit. And I'm a very polite person. I said, oh, excuse me, ma'am. I'd like a Ted Nugent album, please. And the woman said, well, there's only one. Here you go. And I got into Ted Nugent when I was 14. And that was an upgrade. I feel very bad about what comes out of his mouth now, but those were really good records. And so that was the beginning of high school. And then testosterone hits, and I become an incredibly angry person. And my Led Zeppelin records, and my Aerosmith records, and my Steve Miller records no longer worked. My first Van Halen album no longer worked. Seeing Led Zeppelin, which I did, was great, but the music wasn't addressing my abundant, overflowing, volcanic anger. And then I heard punk rock music. I heard Johnny Rotten. I heard The Clash. I heard all kinds of the cramps, all kinds of crazy music from England, from America, from Germany. And I said, finally, my soundtrack has arrived. They're mad, I'm mad, that's it. I am punk rock forever. And that became it for me. All my other records, as good as they were, out the window. I couldn't listen to them anymore because I'm punk rock, that's it. And me and my best friend, Ian Mackay from the band Fugazi, we put away our Hendrix records. Like, what are we doing? We're punk rock now. But Hendrix sounds good, but we are punk rock. 
So I got about two years of drinking that Kool-Aid where all I can listen to is punk rock. The only people I know are punk rockers. That's it. Everyone else is a square who doesn't get it. They're on drugs that make you do this. We want to go fast. We want to be loud. And so one night, I'm at a punk rock party, all 15 of us in the Washington, D.C. punk rock scene, and someone puts on a record. The hair falls out of my head. Outside, every lawn dies. Cars are losing paint. Dogs are howling at the moon. And I said, what record is this? And someone walked over with a picture sleeve of this album, and it was called The Ace of Spades. And I see these three long hairs standing on a pile of sand, and they look like total badasses. But they had long hair. Oh, no, 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 no. They are not punk rock. And whoever put on the record said, shut up, open your mind, and keep listening. By this time the record was over, I was a Motorhead fan. And so, I went to the record store, and they were used to me by now. He's the annoying guy who likes the fast, mean records. I, I need the Motorhead record, please. And the lady with her Stevie Nicks haircut sold me my first Motorhead record. And my punk rock buttons on my jacket, UK subs, damned the ruts, Motorhead. All of us got Motorhead buttons because Motorhead was the crossover band. You could say, I like punk rock and Motorhead. And you had to keep them in two different barns. You couldn't have the idea that two genres could ever cross, that you could be open-minded enough to dig two things at once. So you had to almost give it its own quarantined environment. I like punk rock, please forgive me, but I like Motorhead. And we all did that. We all had Motorhead buttons, we all had that record. And I started reading interviews with Lemmy. A more honest person I could not find in music media. He said things that sounded like he was 500 years old. He'd say the most essential truths. And so there I was with hair this long, much darker. And one night, I come out of the ice cream store I worked at. I was 150 pounds of anger. And I come out with my punk rock jacket on, and there's this long-haired guy who looked utterly terrifying in a leather jacket. And he sees me. He goes, come here. Like, no, because this guy's going to beat my ass. There's a lot of violence in the city I come from. Washington, D.C., look out. And this, he's a heavy metal, scary, long-haired guy. He goes, oh, come here, punk. I'm like, here we go. I'm going to get beat up. So I walk over to him, and I notice he has a motorhead, motorhead button on his leather jacket. And he looks over at my jacket. He goes, you like motorhead, yeah? I said, oh, yes, sir, I do. I went, so do I. I said, well, that's good to know. And he said, I'm Scott. I'm in a band called The Obsessed. And that's how I met Scott Wino Weinrich. Because we are from the same general area. He said, I have a band called The Obsessed. We have a record out. I'm going to buy your record. I bought two copies of his first single just because I had met the dude. But it was the motorhead button that we both had that made that conversation possible. And I don't know about you, but I am quite naive when it comes to music. I think, I have this crazy idea that anywhere in the world I am, I can walk up to anyone who's wearing a Ramones t-shirt or a Motorhead t-shirt like I know them and just go, hey, what's happening? Motorhead. And I know they'll go like, all right. And that's how fights don't happen. Two people in a bar, And you know how we men are. We're always looking to get into it. We're stupid like that. And two men are about to fight, and a Rolling Stones song comes on the jukebox. And they're like, you like that song? I like that song? We were about to hit each other. Now we are friends for life. That is what music does. That is the power of the Wacken Festival, OK? And so. And I believe this, if I have gospel, that is it. If I have a doctrine, 
That is it. If I see that shirt, you and I have a relationship. We're not going to move in together, and you can't live on my couch. But if you have a Ramon shirt on, if you have a Motorhead shirt on, and you're hungry, and I have a sandwich, you may have half. And we don't even have to agree on anything else. The fact that we have that in common, we are done arguing. And that is one of the great things about music. And so, we rewind the tape just a little bit. 1988, I'm living in New Jersey with my band members. We are making music as best we can and starving. I get invited to speak at a thing called the New Music Seminar. And so I said, I'll go. So I take a train into New York and I go to the New Music Seminar. I'm going to be speaking with a panel of musicians about, I forget the topic, many, many years ago. So I walk into a green room with all my guests I'll be on the stage with. There's Hank Ballard, there is Doro, there is Leonard Cohen. There's all these amazing people. And I look across the room and there's an empty seat. I'm very shy, I don't talk to anyone except for Leonard Cohen. And I sit down and I'm staring at the table. Someone sits down across from me. I look up, it's Lemmy. Holy shit, it's Lemmy. I want to stand up and salute because there's an officer on deck. And so I look at him and I'm unable to speak. So I just kind of gave him the nod. He looks at me, the eyebrow comes up. He grabs a piece of paper that was sitting between us. He pulls out a pen. He has a pen. He writes something down, turns the piece of paper around and shoves it in front of me. It says, what am I doing here? And I look at him like, I don't know. It's about 10 in the morning. Around that time, someone walks in with a bottle of wine. Lemmy <laughs> takes a bottle of wine, opens it, and manages to drain the entire bottle in a few minutes. It is now 10.30, time to go on stage. And we're in front of this <clears throat> massive crowd of people. Everyone's speaking. No one has asked Lemmy anything yet. Finally, someone speaks, and Lemmy looks at this person and says, what a bunch of crap. I like rock and roll. And the whole place does exactly what you did. They went nuts. Everyone on the, the panel, dignified musicians, are mad because they got none of the reaction that Lemmy got. And so, I meet Lemmy the first time. And as years go on, I keep running into Lemmy. Festivals, shows, and he always remembers me. I'm like, hi, Lemmy. Hey, Henry, how are you? I'm like, that's my name. I shake his hand. So one time, we're playing in Scandinavia with Motorhead. We're playing away. I look on the side of the stage. Lemmy is watching us. I look over to my bandmates, I go like, Lemmy is watching. I don't know what we're supposed to do. Play better? <clears throat> Pardon my voice. We come off stage. I walk up to Lemmy wanting some kind of evaluation. And he says, not bad for an amateur. This was a theme that would continue throughout our multi-decade friendship. Whenever I'd see Lemmy, I'd always bring him a record to sign. <clears throat> and he'd always sign a Hawkwind record, Motorhead record, whatever I brought him, with a slight insult. Henry, this record's probably too loud for you. I'm like, he's like, or, Henry, I don't recommend you listen to this record. It might offend your more delicate sensibilities. <laughs> Lemmy, a very well-spoken man. And so the years went on. And in 
2003, I became involved with a case. Hold on. Fellas. Hey, monitors. Whoa. Water. Just one. Thank you. So, I become involved with a case called <coughs> the West Memphis Three. Three young men in prison for murder. They didn't commit it. So I saw their plight. They loved music. They were Slayer fans. They were heavy metal fans. They were thrown in prison because of their hair, because of the music they listened to. And I said, <coughs> they need to be rescued. We're gonna help. So I got my bandmates together, and I said, we are going to make a benefit record. And we're gonna sell a ton of it, and we're gonna take all the money, and we're gonna give it to the West Memphis Three. We are gonna make <clears throat> an album of Black Flag songs. And they said, great. So suddenly, we need about 20 singers. I start calling managers, Slayer's manager, this band's manager, and every single one of them said, no, 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 no. Screw you, screw your record. And so, I'm not used to being treated like this. I'm not important, but the record's important. The cause is important. Why are these managers telling me to go screw myself? There's one song on this record. One person in the world can sing it. Lemmy, I need Lemmy. I call Lemmy's management. I expect to get disrespected again. I call, I'm like, hi, my name's Henry. I'm doing this record. Lemmy knows me. Can you ask him if he'll sing this song? And instead of getting hung up on, the nice woman said, I'll ask him and I'll call you back tomorrow. I said, no way. She said, yes. The next day she calls and she says, Lemmy will be on your record. That took about five minutes total. And so I said, what do I do to get Lemmy on the record? Here's his address, pick him up on Saturday He'll be ready. I drive to Lemmy's apartment on Herod Street. Ding dong, the door opens. It's Lemmy, I'm like, damn! He gets in the car, we're driving to the studio. Before I had left for the studio, I told road manager Mike, I said, go to the liquor store, buy a large bag of ice. Buy the largest bottle of Jack Daniels you can find. And a six pack of Coke. Have it ready for when Lemmy walks in. I pick up Lemmy. We're driving to the studio. I said, Lemmy, I've been calling one manager after another and I've been getting told to screw myself over and over. Why could I get you on this record? with one phone call and he looked at me and he said you are my friend you said you needed me and here i am that is lemmy he's always quick with a joke very very witty but when it really comes down to it lemmy was your friend and that you could depend on I bring Lemmy into the studio. Band members have bought wives, they brought their girlfriends, the engineers have brought their girlfriends, they brought their roommates. Everyone wants to meet Lemmy. I walk in with Lemmy, everyone stands up and starts wiping their hand on their pants to get ready for the handshake. Lemmy walks in, does not say a word. He takes three steps in, turns abruptly to his left 
your right, walks up to the Jack Daniels, the ice, and the coke, and makes a drink. I did not tell him there was makings for a drink in the studio. He did not even look. He had liquor GPS in his mind. He did not test the air. He nothing. He went. Do, 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 do. <laughs> he makes a drink. He drinks it. He puts the glass down and he says, Hello, I'm Lemmy. And he met everyone in the room, one by one, like a champ. I said, Lemmy, are you ready to sing? Yeah. We put Lemmy in the booth. He's got the lyrics. He listens to the song. He did two vocals, one right after the other. Both of them, perfect, amazing. He comes out and says, well, how do I do? We're trembling. It's so good. We sit down. We play him the music back. He goes, all right. I said, let me. We are done. Take the bottle of Jack Daniels as our gift. I will take you back to your apartment. So I take Lemmy back to his apartment. He says, come in. I'm not going to pass this up. I walk into an apartment that is this big. It is filled with things. There are paths of clean carpet. He goes, stay on the path. So I wind my way through World War II memorabilia to the command center, a couch with a table, notepads, bottles of Jack Daniels, pens, and remotes for video games. So I said, this is the center of the Lem universe. He went, yeah, I also sleep on it too. I walked by his bedroom and his bedroom was half books and one space for a skinny man to sleep. And I said, oh, Lemmy lives alone in a small apartment books and the space for a man. How sad. And then I remembered, that's exactly how my bed looks too. And so we get up from the couch and we go into the living room, which is up to here with stuff. And he said, what do you think? I said, looks great to me. And he said, something amazing happened the other day. I said, what? He said, I found a suitcase from a tour I was on five years ago. I said, how did you lose it? I put it down and I couldn't find it. And I found it five years later and I opened it up. It is like a time capsule. I said, it disappeared and then it reappeared yesterday. Like it was a miracle. And then he swept his hand over his living room and said, my living room is like, and he couldn't finish the sentence. And so I said, it's like the sea. And I was totally pulling that out of my ass. And he went, what do you mean? I said, and I'm like, oh no. I said, ah, uh, because the sea is mysterious. It takes away, but then it gives it back again. He went like, yeah, all right. What's your place like? I said, perfectly clean, everything in alphabetical order. He said, thought so. Again, the slight insult. I was like, ah. And so I have to go back to the studio. And so as I'm making my way towards the door, Lemmy says, you like books? I'm like, yeah, read this one. And he has lots of books, big reader, Lemmy, very, very smart man. And he gives him this massive book on communist artwork. Huge book. I'm like, thunk. Okay, I'll read it and bring it back at the end of the semester. I'll need the book back. And I realize I'm now in a book club with Lemmy. And so I've got this massive book. 
and I'm walking towards the door. And he's just like, and he gives me another book on World War II. He goes, you can have this one. I said, damn, man, thanks. And so I leave his place with two books. The first one I did give back after a month with no marks on it. I bought my own copy. And the other one I still have. And the next time I saw Lemmy, who loved to collect daggers and swords, a lot of them, he pulls out this crazy sword from Africa. He was like, what do you think? I said, looks like you could cut someone up with it. And he said, I want you to have it. I said, damn, man, thanks. Why? And with, without any irony, he looked at me and he said, I've always liked you. You're a good guy. I don't want you to have this. That sword sits in my office in plain sight for like the last 15 years. It is one of my prized possessions. And so, every once in a while, I would run into Lemmy, and he always remembered me, and we always had a laugh, and we would always argue about music. And I'd say, hey, I just played this Hawkwind album this morning. I don't like it. But it's Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. It is a perfect album. Too much acoustic on it. But you're on it. No, no, no. Hall of the Mountain Grill. That's a better record. I go, That's a good one, too. Anyway, last summer, Lemmy is in a movie that I wrote the screenplay for. The director comes to Los Angeles and he says, I need you to pick up Lemmy, bring him to the studio, wrangle him, and get him back home. I said, you got it. So I drive to Lemmy's apartment. He's moved two blocks from the other place, very close to the rainbow. And I knock on the door. Cheryl, his girlfriend, says, he'll be out soon. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And finally, Lemmy emerges resplendent in his amazing clothes, custom cowboy hat, boots, and he gets into the SUV. Good afternoon, Henry, very good to see you again. I said, hello, sir. And I told him all about the Portuguese pressing of the Urban Gorilla single by Hawkwind that I had just gotten and wasn't that great that I finally had that? Yeah, we got in a lot of trouble for making that record. But I have the Portuguese picture sleeve. So what? It's a big deal. We get to the place and he pours a drink. Vodka and orange juice. I am amazed. I said, Lemmy, orange juice? He said, I'm trying to get more healthy. I said, You'll be ready for the Olympics by spring. And so he does this scene for the film Dutter Damerung. He was amazing. I dropped him off back at his place. And then a few months later, I'm on the east coast of America in a place called Hartford, Connecticut. I am there to do two nights of free shows for the Mark Twain Museum. Mark Twain, a great American, who spoke out against racism. And it's amazing, no one killed him. But he's too famous to be killed. Of course, like a lot of great Americans, he was broke. And so the Mark Twain Museum needed money. So they contacted me and they said, hey, you like Mark Twain? I said, very much. Would you come and do a benefit show for us? I said, no, I'll do two. And so I'm in a hotel on a Sunday night in raining Connecticut got the earplugs in, I'm in the cafe, I'm writing in my notebook, and a young man walks in front of me and starts waving his arms. And I'm like, no, young man, Henry, an old man is with his coffee and his notebook. Do not disturb, this better be good. And I pull my earplugs out, and this young man says, hey, my name is Ian, I work with Lemmy. I said, is Motorhead in this hotel? He said, we are. I said, tell Lemmy I am here 
and I must, I must speak with him. He said, he knows you're here. He's taking a nap. And whenever Lemmy sleeps, we let him sleep because he's slept 15 minutes since 1975. I said, I understand. He said, look, give me your cell phone number and tomorrow when we get on the bus, I'm going to call you, you'll come down to the bus and you'll meet Lemmy. And I said, great. So the next day around noon, I get the call from Ian. I run down to the tour bus and I jump on and there's Mickey D and there's Phil some of the nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. Excellent musicians and excellent human beings. And Ian says, Lemmy is in the back lounge. He's expecting you. And I walk back there and Lemmy's alone. And I notice that he looks somewhat frail and his eyes are as big as his head. They're like saucers. Just had big eyes anyway, but his, his cheeks are are, are slim and his eyes were big. He goes, hey Henry, good to see you. And I shook his hand and I said, Lemmy, I just heard your new album last night. And I said, as, a, as always, amazing lyrics, great music. He said, thank you. So we get to talking and Lemmy looks pretty tired. And he says to me, so you're coming with us to the show. You're gonna sing on stage with us tonight. I'm like, well, actually, tonight, I have a show of my own. And I see this disappointment on his face. And I almost wanted to cancel my show to not let Lemmy down. And so I, I'm sorry, sir. I have a show. I happen to be in the same hotel as you. And he went, okay. Are you sure you can't come? I'm like, no, I really, <laughs> I really have a show down the street in a museum in front of 200 people. I really do have to do that. And so Mickey D and Phil came in and the four of us spoke for a while. I said, so, okay, what are you guys doing next? And they said, we're going on the Motorhead cruise. I go, what do you mean? It's an ocean liner with a bunch of drunken fornicators and heavy metal music. I said, what do you mean? Like 3,000 inebriated people and Motorhead. I'm like, damn, I want to go. I mean, just to watch naked people fall over the side, I, I want to go. But I looked at Lemmy. I said, I thought to myself, damn, man, can you handle this? And I wanted to say to him, Lemmy, go home. Let your amazing girlfriend Cheryl cook for you, because she's a cook. Catch your breath. Rest up. But Lemmy was his own person. Lemmy was a true individual. Lemmy's going to do what Lemmy's going to do. So he's gonna go do that damn cruise and another show and another show and another show. About three months later, Lemmy had passed away and I had no idea that was going to be the last time I was ever going to see Lemmy. But like a lot of you, I genuinely love Lemmy. He's always been good to me. His music's been good to me, and a more fair and honest human being, I don't think I have ever met. I love this guy. And so, not knowing when the next time I would see Lemmy, I sat next to him in the back of that bus. I looked him right in the eye. And I said, Lemmy, you are one of my favorite people, and it's always good to see you again, my friend. And he looked me right in the eye and said, it's always good to see you, Henry. And I, I know he meant it. And so we shook hands and I left. And that was the last time I ever saw him. And so when we all got the news that Lemmy had passed away, and Lemmy should have been at Vakken this year. He was gonna be here. But the facts of life got in the way. So Lemmy was born like you and me. Legs, arms, a head, guts, whatever. Not superhuman, just a body. He took that one carcass, that frame, 70 years, 90 million gallons of beer, 
two oceans of hard alcohol, a line of speed that went for at least 150,000 kilometers. How much acid? We'll never know. How much hashish? We'll never know. He played at a decibel level that would wound animals. Have you ever seen people in front of a motorhead gig? They get become paralytic, like putting a needle into the brain of a frog in biology class. They just, it's the music. He was there for all of it and still got 70 years out of a single human body. He had fun every single day. He was loved all over the world. He was loved by not only you and me, but every single person who ever saw him in Tokyo, who ever saw him in France, Belgium, Spain, Norway, etc., etc. In his own lifetime, there's a great lesson to be learned from Lemmy. He lived for truth. He lived for rock and roll. He did not pose out. What you saw, that was the man 24-7. Think about your life. How much do you mean it? How sincere are you with what you do? Can you match Lemmy? Think about it. That might end up being one of the greatest tests of your time. Do you have the same personal integrity as Lemmy? It's more of a test than you might think when you really get down to it. And so, it's good to be back at Vakken. I will be back here on this stage, or that stage, or this stage, for the next two days, telling you different stories. So if you want part two and part three, check your itinerary and show up if you want. You are big, strong adults with your own mind. No one tells you what to do. But I'd really appreciate it if you showed up. Hail Lemmy, hail Vakken, hail all of you. I'll see you tomorrow. Good afternoon.